Hi there. Almost nine, so just waiting for my guests to join me. Um, bear with me. This is actually my first uh, time doing a live myself. Um, so let's see. Oh. All right, Laura, looks like we have you here. Um, waiting for dietitian Anna to join us. I'm super, super excited to, to connect with her. Um, good morning, Laura. So I was just going to this is my first solo Facebook Live, so, or uh, Instagram Live. So like can you the, hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Hey there, Allie. Thanks for joining us. Favorite topic of Laura's and mine, and I know uh, dietitian Anna as well. So just waiting for that I, little. Yeah, she's on. So we just wait for her test. Okay. So if you are, let's see. Ah, there we go. Ah, and that was what I was worried about happening. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do we have Anna here with us? Hi! We did oh, it. The two of you, it's a little bit like you get the split screen of uh, sisters there. Hi, Laura. Hello. How are you, Anna? Nice to officially meet you. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us. And I think I just have to start with just a slight fangirl, Anna. Um, just uh, I discovered your feed. It was another mom that turned me on to it. Just so, so helpful. And a lot of the parents, that Laura and I both engage that's really a part of any parent having a, a child with an eating disorder having to go through this process of really sort of rethinking things and and new opinions and things like that so thank you for for all that you do absolutely it is so my pleasure I'm delighted to be in space with both of you and I'm so grateful for the work that you guys are doing yeah so I'll just introduce folks where this is um, a live between equip and between dietitian um, I'm Jay I'm the director of lived experience here at Equip and also the mom of someone who's been in recovery from anorexia for quite some time after having an onset at 17. Interestingly related to this topic, I am also a person who grew up in a sugar-free home. So we will have lots to chat about on that. So uh, uh, Anna, do you want to introduce yourself? And then Laura, you can as well. Sure. I am Anna Sweeney. Um, I am a an anti-diet, fat-positive eating disorder registered dietitian and I feel really fortunate to have the ridiculous platform that I did like I don't know how that happened um I have been in the eating disorder treatment community for about 15 years which is incredible um I am really passionate about this topic and I think ugh, I'm really interested to hear about the sugar-free household and I know that Halloween is kind of like part one of what becomes holidays that are really food focused. And so it, it feels really appropriate that we're having this conversation well before uh, we get, you know, into the holiday season. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Laura. Hey, everyone. So I'm Laura Cohen. I work as a family mentor at Equip, which means I help families through the process of when their kiddos are going through treatment. And I formerly was a registered dietitian, was my original professional background. Um, my daughter was diagnosed with anorexia almost three years ago, and it shifted every single thing that I ever thought about wellness. I was taught probably like Anna, although I'm older than you, Anna. I was educated completely in diet culture. Um, worked in the wellness industry for years. And once my daughter was diagnosed, even though I thought I was an anti-diet dietitian for all those years, I said those words proudly. And I really wasn't um, because that's really just all I knew. And I've learned how wrong a lot of the stuff that I put out there was. And, you know, I feel sometimes brave that I just look and, and just say to people, I'm sorry. And now I'm here to really change the face of um, what we put out in the world. Cause it's, it, you know, as JD, all of us, we see, we see kiddos every day that um, things like we're talking about started off an eating disorder and there's so much work that needs to be done. So I'm really proud and humbled to be here. Thank you. And as we jump in, I just want to make the point that the things that, um, 
is really important. It's not to shame or blame parents for past views that they've had. And in fact, most of us have those views because the medical establishment, you know, taught us to have those views. And we were doing what we really thought was the best quality of parenting we could do. And so that's one of the things I love about FPT as a format is it invites us to change along with our child and, and have a really recovery supporting environment. So um, Anna, we'll jump right in. Um, what are some of the comments you often hear about um, sugar, candy, sweets, sugar addiction, that sort of thing? So I think I want to separate um, like parental concern around candy. I think that is you know, that's in one bucket. And then there's kind of the trickle down effects of what it means to be a parent who is doing like the best things for their kids, acknowledging that this is absolutely a planet that has very binary beliefs about food. Like this is good food and this is bad food. This is clean food. This is like whatever, whatever that means. Um, the messaging is really, really strong. And I super believe that when parents are making decisions about how to navigate Halloween, they are doing all of the things with best of intentions, right? We are, nobody is looking to do harm when navigating people wearing witch costumes, right? Or like being a cat. The point is not for us to be permanently frightened. And it's really, really hard for us to decouple ourselves from the messaging that is so pervasive that says, and this is, so, it's so it's so not surprising and so not new, but the, I think, kind of direction that food and fear mongering around food has moved, particularly in the last like five or 10 years, more like away from carbohydrates as a general concept it makes this even more challenging. We know, right? So in my, in my practice, I talk to our <clears throat> parents. I have worked with kids of all ages through these holidays. I have a number of humans who really do um, engage with the idea that avoiding sugar, avoiding candy is the way to, you know, promote greater health and greater peace with food. And I'm wanting to kind of open this up to dialogue because I've said, I've said a lot of things. I'm wondering if you guys have anything to say before I just keep going. Cause I could go forever. Keep going, keep going. Yeah. So I think, so there's parents wanting to make good decisions for their kids. And then there are the, you know, the hand-me-down effects of what does it mean if my mom or dad or parent or whomever said, the guardian said that you can't eat sugar or you shouldn't be eating sugar, or do the kind of the switch witch thing where we're bargaining with our children about the kind of candy that they can have and how long they keep candy out. Um, we are engaging with diet culture in the context of playing dress up. The minute we start exerting kind of control around how a person is supposed to supposed to um, interact with Halloween candy. So this is this is what I'm hearing mostly from parents. And then there's the kind of the flip side of, yeah, and it feels like something to go into my office and there's candy everywhere. And I feel like I can't walk past this desk and not grab candy. And every time I walk past this, this certain desk, I grab something and then I make some big meaning about that. Um, and so it, you know, it not, this is not a singular story. This is actually a lot more complicated than playing dress up. Yeah. And I, I want to say it's, it's only, not just parents hearing this message just too, as I think about, you know, my past is as an educator and a teacher. And I think about a lot of those messages as well. And then I think, cause my kids are uh, range in age from almost 28 to, to 38. So big, big range. And it's been a minute, but how different it was sort of with the oldest from the youngest and how like, the very beginning like candy in kindergarten and first grade was like graph how many you got of each piece right it wasn't messaging around um sort of how dangerous it is and you know that sort of thing so all of us as authority figures have so much power in this messaging yeah i had a situation this morning that i thought was very appropriate for this conversation because we do talk about the trickle down effect and i was just you know scrolling through facebook having my cup of coffee this morning 
there was a totally nice post from a local mom in my town who wanted to know where to find candy because the, I guess Target, like some of the stores were sold out. And the comment that, that was put was, they must all be, you know, all the people that waited till last minute to buy the candy so we didn't keep it in our homes. And it was just such an innocent comment that I knew there was so much that we could unpack from that comment, right? And, oh, I buy the worst candy because I don't want it in my home. And our kids are hearing that. Right. So it's there's just so much about that. So much about that. Well, and I think as we sort of delve into this idea of you know, sugar addiction, is that a thing? You know, Anna, you can really provide all the content around that. And I think it also does come to the conversation of the R City mindset, right? And and again to that conversation of me, uh spoiler alert, growing up in a sugar free home uh, does not make you not care about sugar. You care about yeah. sugar. Very, very, very much. And your your comment about sort of at people's desks and things like that. Um, I had, you know, prior to do my daughter getting sick and doing all this work and all that kind of stuff and looking at the sociology of this, I would have those same feelings about taking the candy and that kind of thing. But I would, I would always take the candy. And once I decided to resolve scarcity mindset and just ate what I wanted for an extended period of time, regardless of the guilt mm -hmm. or something like that, all of a sudden, I was in a space where sometimes I took the candy and sometimes I didn't. Because sometimes I wanted it and sometimes I didn't. I, sometimes I didn't. But when it was a very scarce resource, I could not get enough of it. Um, but so tell us that in, in, in the context of sugar addiction, that topic. So, I, gosh, I really am like so frustrated that this is a thing because in real life, as humans, we need carbohydrate fuel to exist on this planet. So in one way or another, and this is not from an addictive space, but when we eat carbohydrates at the end of the day, at the end of the digestive process, like we are dealing with sugars that it, like, this is good. This is important. This is what keep our brains and bodies working. I know that's not what we're talking about right now. And with regard to sugar addiction, there isn't research that has ever been done on humans. And this is a really good thing because we have IRB protocols that protect people from being harmed. So when we're looking at research, and I, I remember probably started seeing a lot of research coming out about food, like sugar addiction, probably about a decade ago, they were looking, talking about mice being choosing sugar over like an illicit drug. And what was demonstrated and not made obvious was that the only mice that were choosing sugar were the ones that were starved. And so in the absence of adequate energy intake, of course, they're going to choose food because survival. Um, and so when we think about what you said earlier about deprivation mindset, um, and I think there's, so deprivation mindset is one thing. And I also want to really validate that you can be a human, you can be a house that has access to a wide variety of food. There can be enough food in your home, in your life experience, and sugar itself, because of the way that it is polarized in our culture, and so many humans have kind of righteousness ideas around it, it really is simple for that to become a superbly um, energized the eating experience that makes people feel as though I can't stop going to that desk. I'm walking past my coworker, I'm taking this candy. I have feelings about the fact that I am taking this food beyond I could just have candy like as part of my, as part of my life. And then mm -hmm. if I am able to give myself permission or give my kids permission to have candy, I'm, maybe I won't actually wish to interact with it in a way that leaves me feeling um, out of control because I don't want to invalidate the feeling of being like of feeling addicted, of feeling compelled to eat sugar. I believe you. If someone says this to me, I am not here to say that that is not a real feeling, that that's not a real physiological experience. And I'm always, always, always going to ask about where deprivation lives, because I promise you that it is part of the equation. Yeah, yeah. 
I, I agree with that. And Laura, you had to do such a shift around your beliefs around that. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, for so many years, you know, I was always talking about wellness and eating the good foods, the good foods, right? And, you know, putting food in that morality. And um, it was uh, interesting to really make that platform of all foods are equal. You know, food is food. You know, when I mean, as, as Anna knows, we break it down, everything is a carb, fat, you know, or a protein. That's it. And we make this big thing about the morality of and the morality of ourselves that when we eat clean and we eat good and we don't eat gluten or sugar those things and sometimes you need to decrease those medically i understand but that's not what we're talking about here there's also that morality there and um really going on the other side of it and seeing what diet culture and wellness culture whatever you want to call it has done to that is was an extremely important pivot um, and one that a lot of people's heads spun around when they saw me make of it. But it's, you know, seeing it on the other side, you know, working in the eating disorder sphere, it's been so eye opening, all those little conversations and um, how the eating disorder start or disordered eating, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's, it's just eye opening. Yeah. yeah, it really is. And it also, um, because we've had this sort of this family history, right, of me growing up in a sugar and then did not have a sugar-free home for my kids and actually that's you know very have strong feelings about you know my daughter would have had anorexia regardless sort of she was just very genetically biologically disposed to this but then also have unpacked all those messages i have a grandson who's seven years old who has been raised 100 percent on intuitive eating and with the idea that very often he had blueberries and a cookie on his lunch plate or things like that. you know what is super astonishing is when he is a place with other families with kids and things like that a birthday party or whatever it is there are times that he will say no thank you to a cupcake and it's so interesting to see all the adults jaws are on the floor like they've never in their lives seen a kid refuse a cupcake and it's not that he doesn't like cupcakes he does but maybe we made cupcakes the night before or something like that or maybe he was at another birthday party so just seeing how when you step away from all that messaging about good and bad and instilling fear over that how it can just be sort of part of things and and i also think as as you were both talking about food you know as it breaks down too i think part of that morality thing has been that we've been programmed to think of food only as fuel the only legitimate use dynamic whatsoever around food is fuel and that is so not true um at all do the two of you want to talk about that maybe a little i happy to i think what's really neat is that we can use fuel like food to say enhance performance for athletes we can use fuel to food as fuel to have our bodies do really cool things like growing and getting stronger and learning new skills, whatever. And we have prefrontal cortexes that allow us to appreciate food as more than just like sustenance. What a neat thing to be able to have a taste experience that allows us to come back to something. What a dynamic thing to think about food in all of the ways that it serves us. And so thinking about in the holiday season that is coming up, like there are maybe foods that are about family and maybe there's a time for food to be celebratory and maybe there's time for food to be about grieving or coming together and being in community. Like thinking about food exclusively as fuel is missing the majority of what the eating experience ought to be. Yeah, I love that, like that, just taking the lens out and looking at it and and in all cultures we have these these things celebrations of right. the yep. experience um yeah laura any any thoughts on that as yeah. well from you? yeah my first thought is um the term emotional eater and i always am like you have emotions and you're an eater right and emotional eater has such a negative connotation you're going through a really hard time should you be shamed because you're relying on that comfort of food that makes you feel like that, that whatever it is, I'm not going to name anyone's feelings, but you know, one thing I was thinking is I don't want everyone watching this to close their eyes. Cause we definitely could have people driving, but take that moment 
to close your eyes or just, you know, close your thought for a second and think about a food that brings you that warm feeling inside, not in your belly, in your heart. And that comfort, that warmth, whatever it may be. And then someone shaming that. Oh, well, this food makes me, you know, um, chicken pot pie. I don't know, just the first thing. I don't even really like chicken pot pie. But the first thing that came in my mind. And someone may be like, that just, that feeling brings back when I was a child. And I would, you know, come home and my mom or oh, my caregiver was right there. And then someone's like, and, then, and the same thing. They're like, yeah, but I don't eat that anymore because it's really fattening. And it's just so sad to, you know, to have that. And you got to decouple that, you know, because food is emotion and that's not a bad thing. Yeah. And as we bring that into that, this, you know, Halloween and this all fall winter holiday state, right? Um, Halloween is a tradition, right? Um, for, for most people that have that. And, and that part of that tradition is, you know, is the candy, right? And everything that it's the trick or treating, it's the costumes, it's the whole thing. So, you know, sort of thinking about like, what do we, what do we lose for our, our, our kids when we have, this, um, you know, wellness sort of culture, very strong morality, you know, somebody really called out, I saw a comment go by um, about the binary thinking about what a huge, you know, like revelation that is. So I, I'm not I'm not exactly sure that I understand your question, but I just like to underscore that nothing in this point in the world happens without the influence of wellness culture, without the influence of diet culture, like zero, zero things, zero interactions with food. And this is not entirely fully thought out right now, but it is it is hard. This is a hard time on the planet to be an eater. We all have like encyclopedias in our computer, in our, in our hands. Um, I like I'm talking about an encyclopedia. So that ages me in a certain way. And now there is like all of the information in the world and your favorite influencer telling you things about how to do Halloween in a healthy way, how to hack the holidays, whatever. Um, this is, this is just, straight up acknowledgement of the fact that this is a hard, it's a hard time to be a person who is confidently eating, confidently feeding, you know, friends, family, um, and navigating inevitable judgment because food does have such weight and such energy around it. It is so my desire for everyone to be able to ultimately kind of come back to a place where the body is driving the bus and we are taking back our autonomy around food choice that we are not eating simply for the the point of you know health if that is the only focus that we are nourishing ourselves for the most like ha like the healthiest option i would actually say that is not healthy even a little bit right and so I think one of the things that frustrates me about this time of year is that there is some sense that it is such a high stakes experience. Like if you do this, the decisions that you make on the 31st of October and then the days that follow will result in some really significant something happening. And I, I really do want to validate for folks who feel like their nervous systems get pretty hijacked at this time of year that this is real and you are deserving of of peace and of of healing and kind of neutrality around food i also acknowledge that that in itself is is a privilege um and this is something that like we have to practice and we have to push back because the noise unfortunately isn't going to go anywhere yeah i i think that's such a good point and i think in the tradition piece you kind of brought it in there like almost replacing wellness culture as a tradition for other, you know, pieces of people's cultures and things like that, which I think just comes with such, such loss. And um, also, yeah, just sort of bleeds over sort of into everything. There's, you know, houses you can't go to, or kids are then judging each other's and then schools are judging lunch boxes, you know, sort of this, all of this feeds into it. How, you know, if parents, want to or parents or other people want to rethink Halloween and how they interact with food and sugary foods throughout all this holiday season what are some ways 
to talk to people about that? So I think, firstly, I would love for parents to feel supported in thinking about shifting the way they talk about food and kind of sitting back and getting curious about what what that might look like, what that might entail, what that might mean in terms of communicating with a teacher. Like I, my family is an all foods fit family. And so when Sarah is in school, it's really important to me that she's able to eat her Halloween candy and not receive any around it, something to that effect. Um, and Sarah is a made up person. Uh, and I think this is a, you know, this is a matter of practice. This is a matter of doing things that are going to result in some humans probably having some pretty strong reactions. And I'm always so interested in like, why, why do you, why do you care so very much about how these other humans are navigating, you know, food and eating? The kindest thing that we can give to anyone who is enjoying Halloween is the promise that candy is not a singular experience that happens on October 31st. It makes sense. I remember, I have very specific memories and I am fortunate to have never experienced an eating disorder. I do this work because my sister had an eating disorder and has since recovered from an eating disorder. And I remember organizing my candy and, you know, doing the things, having all of the chocolate in one corner and all of the tangy things and stuff. Like it, which in some circumstances would feel like, oh, that's really bizarre. But in fact, it's really normal. I would even say if candy is not a part of your kid's life, it's super normal for your kid to even hide candy. And if you find it, it's a matter of having conversation and making sure that your children know that it is okay for them to have foods. I think that we get really worried and it would be very hard to not be concerned, particularly because we know what wellness culture says about um, sugar and candy. And I also wanna just for a minute, ex like extend this beyond just wellness culture, like what influencers are saying. Medical providers, dietitians, Healthcare practitioners of all sorts are also humans on this planet. So you might have received very specific feedback about how to navigate Halloween or how to navigate holidays. And part of that might look like making rules around how a human interacts with, in this case, candy. Um, I really, really, really would love to encourage you to normalize the idea of having sweet things. And of course, this is a very exciting, we're getting dressed up, we're going from door to door to door, and it is safe to do that. This like this is this is a new Halloween year. Um, super exciting. We don't want to, we don't want the food to be the spookiest part of it. Yeah, you just made me think about when you said this is a new Halloween year. Uh first pandemic year, uh, Halloween, um, and there was, do we go trip or treat? Like all of the stuff around or treating was related to social distance and everything. And um, that was one of the, I think coming, you know, we were several months into sort of whatever we call the lockdown, you know, mm -hmm. being home and that kind of thing, and kids being out of school and thinking like, we did end up going trick treating. And in my grandson's neighborhood, people did such a creative things to get the candy like you know they put little things to put it down a dude or on a string and got it and just like that was one of the first feelings of like communal normalcy that I remember if you know if his parents were no we don't need candy or it's, it's this is not important or whatever let's a great stay home sort of what we would have missed with sort of still seeing oh my neighbor's care about me. We all do, you know, we are all in community. Um, yeah, I think that's just a, such an important point. And, and the point you made about fear, and Laura, you talk about this, you know, as well, where we spend a lot of same spaces and sort of that, that point, I think that it's actually better to eat the candy than be afraid of the candy, like overall, physical and mental wellness, right? Uh, totally. Yeah.
Yes, 100%. And one thing I was thinking about when, um, when you guys were talking was this, someone listening today, maybe the first time that they're hearing, you know, professionals, wellness professionals, I don't like the word, but you know what I'm saying, uh, professionals in this field that are talking opposite of what they're used to hearing. And I honor that. I see you. And if you could learn anything from today by listening to us talk, it's, this is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It may feel really yucky to you to not say to your kids, that's enough, or to make those little comments to yourself. I'm just having that one piece of candy, and, or I'm not going to eat dinner tonight. I'm just going to eat candy, whatever those thoughts may be. If this is your first time hearing things like this, give yourself some grace. And if the first thing you're doing this year is just hearing those comments and being aware of them and acknowledging them, that's your first step. And that's huge. Um, you, you can't, I always say you can't unsee something once you learn about it. And if this is the first time, make this year be the year that you're acknowledging it. And maybe refrain from some of the comments that you may make about yourself first. And then it can trickle down because kids hear everything you're saying. Your partner hears everything you're saying. Um, when you're posting something on you know, all the social media platforms, people are reading it, just like I was talking about that innocent comment today. So maybe this is just the year to, to start that process. Yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful thing. It is very, it is very process oriented and a lot of the whole shift in thinking. Um, you talked, Anna, about you know, sort of the science of sugar addiction being um, pretty clear that sugar addiction is not something that has been proven. You know, I, I know I've read other studies that you know, if you kind of look at the way uh, you know, drugs work for people in the brain and some of that stuff, that just sort of the pathways just aren't, are not the same. So we can feel pretty confident about that, the research base and scientifically. Um, what do you say to folks who are just absolutely convinced that their child reacts to sugar in a you know, sort of very powerful way? You mm -hmm. go to a birthday without hearing a parent say like, this is what happens when they have sugar. This is why I don't let them have sugar. So I think there, there are several things to think about, like Halloween night, and I actually use this as an example when I'm talking about blood sugar curves um, regularly in my, in my clinical life. So like thinking about like the behavior of a child on Halloween night and kid is super hyped up and then they have, and then they crash, right? And it's just because there's a, beyond candy, there's a lot of energy that goes into this sort of day. And then there's a lot of meaning made of the, you know, off the wall kid and then the zonked out baby, whatever. Um, this is normal. Like in, in a lot of ways, a day like Halloween is going to pack unique energy because it's a unique holiday experience. That I have a lot of compassion for humans who are navigating feeding their children and really, really believing and experiencing that when they eat certain types of food, their behavior changes in a really specific way. I am not here to say that what you are witnessing isn't real. I am curious about the nature of interaction with that kind of food that your child is accustomed to. Um, because again, there's something very special about you get free candy walking around dressed up like not you. You're going to be exciting, excited and it's going to have kind of a hype trickle down. When I hear folks talking about kids responding acutely to sugar, I'm curious, like, do you notice the same thing when they eat an orange, when they drink like juice? Do you experience something similar? And again, I'm not looking to shame anyone for the way that they are navigating parenting. I, I think that question is like a, at least one, maybe two generations prior kind of thing to be exploring. Yeah, I love that both of you are both curiosity, lack of judgment, all of that stuff bringing it into it. And uh, I'm reminded when I was thinking there was a sort of a thing that when we have Santa Ana wins, like kids are out of control. 
I don't know if there's any correlation between Anna Anna wins and, and kids in classrooms being out of control, but wins certainly aren't sugar, right? And so, you know, sort of that same sort of thing. Um, so as you, you know, as we think about parents going in and maybe making this shift this year, what are some good things that come of unfettered access to Halloween candy? I think you'll get less of the, the craziness um, because it just becomes obsessive. You know, just how we started it with the scarcity, the scarcity mindset. Um, I mean, just to Anna's point, when you think about Halloween, can you come up with a more stimulating evening ever, ever? <laughs> like, and anxiety provoking evening for a lot of kiddos too. So you add all of that in there. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's a, I forgot what the original question was. I went on that whole stimulating thing. What, what was the original thing that you had said my tangent to? What are the benefits? As we've said, this is a yeah. learning for people and they're going to take this under consideration for this year and, and years to come, right? What are, what are some of the benefits of allow, allowing children to have that access to candy? And, um, you know, because I think there are some good things that come out of that. I think you'll see less of the behaviors that you're talking about when parents think, oh, my kids go crazy with the sugar. I think if it becomes more normalized and there's not such this putting sugar on this pedestal that they can only have a certain amount, it'll just bring that whole energy. I'm very big on energy. It'll bring the whole energy around it down. And, you know, when you're like, you can have four pieces of candy and hey, I did it. I'm not shaming anyone that did it. I think my kids were allowed a lot of a certain of candy a year when they were younger and but it just becomes so much more when you do that because chances are if we would just been like you can have what you want they may stop at three right like you take that whole um you know the the boundaries away from it that you put it, it just it, it takes all of that that craziness away from it so i think that you'll find kids be actually a little bit calmer yeah i'm interested in your response um Anna, and then also sort of as you mentioned rules before, because I think this. So I, I super wish that there was a way to like cast a spell and make the energy around, you know, certain foods immediately become more calm. If a child or a human has experienced deprivation or like observation of rules around food, the idea of then saying, hands off the wheel, everything is going to be fine, automatically, is probably not true, right? That I don't think that's a realistic expectation. Um, and I also think this is a place where we, as, you know, as grownups, um, can really model ourselves having the ability to eat a variety of different foods, normalizing the heck out of candy, and also or out of any, whatever, whatever food it is. Um, and really normalizing the fact that Halloween, this is not the place that you are going to start um, mm -hmm. teaching new lessons about food, right? And you can, this can be the first year that you don't put guidelines around how a kid consumes food, how a person interacts with candy. This could be the first year that you are watching and witnessing your child eat, maybe even in ways that make you feel uncomfortable. And what would it feel like to actually just like sit with that and have the candy still be there? It's not like put the orange plastic thing on the top shelf. It's the orange plastic thing is, you know, a part of the pantry. And with time and practice and consistent access and consistent messaging, the ease that you are describing, I think is very, very possible. I, I don't want any parent go, or any human who's listening to this having the expectation that if you just say like, it's going to be good, I'm, I'm fine having this, that automatically you are going to experience kind of the ease of having the ability to choose to have candy with the sermon or choose not to have candy. If this has been an energized food in any type of way, and this is candy and everything, 
to expect ourselves to instantaneously experience a shift, I think is like just profoundly unfair and not realistic. Yeah. yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It would definitely not happen overnight by any stretch of the imagination. The kid would be a frenzy to eat it all because they're finally given that option. Mm -hmm. Right. You as a parent are like, oh, this can't be right. And, and it is. You have to think of it as a process. Mm -hmm. I think one I've learned um, about this is that what it, one of the gifts it gives kids is the ability to not replace their views with our external rule, not mm -hmm. to them, you can't trust your body, your body, you know, your body and your brain are untrustworthy, you have to have this set of rules. And, you know, again, that may mean some experimentation with, you know, eating so much candy that maybe you have a stomach ache. And I think casting that is not a bad thing. But a thing that it's learned. I'm, I'm reminded of uh, my grandson's favorite candy is actually jelly beans. And so um, he, he enjoys Easter. But I remember um, last Easter, or the one before she so was five or six, had, you know, all the jelly beans in the bottom of the basket and everything and was sitting there eating some jelly beans. And then he looked at it and he said, um, I really love these jelly beans, but I think if I eat any more of them, my tongue is going to hurt. And he just went and put the basket, you know, on a chair away from where he was and um, honestly could have returned to it at any point that day or over the next week and didn't. He'd had his fill of jelly beans. But I think that's the beauty of it is um, learning that we as humans actually can be trusted. We don't need a set of wellness culture rules. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, in the context of wrapping this up in terms of, of what we think about Halloween, right? Um, Halloween, the spookiness and the fear, you know, as or as you were talking about, like what the night's like, a good neighbor who had like the scariest house going up and all that kind of stuff and so like that's part of it getting scared but not too scared and all of that like our food and our candy should not engender us in us the same fear that the spooky house does or the scary costume those sorts of things so yeah, i 100 percent agree yeah it's part, part of it it's part of the tradition it's not yeah. the whole there's so much more to Halloween. Yeah, and I, I truly do believe, have come to believe that um, there's no food as scary as fear of food. Um, and that's, yes, about it. That. I yeah. love that. Yeah. Um, yeah, there is, that's a true statement. There is no such thing, no food that is scarier than a fear food. Um, totally true. And this can be a time for us to really evaluate the utility of hanging on to these rules that we have and they are handed down and they are all around us all of the time and with practice and with patience and with a little bit of tolerance of discomfort most humans will have the ability to kind of self self-regulate and it become food can be a much more neutral experience when we actually think about allowing ourselves to have it and not having um, like alarmist feelings around what we eat. Yeah, as we said at the start, we're having this uh, this season for a lot of people that involves a lot of things. I just think at Thanksgiving, I'm going to make my mother's been gone for some time now. I use my mother and grandmother's recipe. That is very important to our family. You know, the same thing at other at um, other times. And so, yeah, keeping it all, you know, traditions. If you if you uh, you know want to, maybe this year you're just sort of the situation and thinking about what these three women said, and um, you know, thinking about your next move and things like this. But I think if we if we maybe open some minds to the conversation, given a little bit of science grounding for the fact that you know sugar addiction is, is not actually a thing in general um i think we will have done our job today so any any parting thoughts from you laura I, you know i think it, to wrap it all up is what I, we've all said is awareness awareness is the first step this is such a long process it, it really is and it's um there are stages that you go through there's the awareness and then there's the denial and all the things it just takes a long time. So being gentle with yourself during the process, being aware of all the feelings that come up, because yes, discomfort, we talk all the time about, you know, distress tolerance and all of that. That's 
part of it here too is being able to sit with that distress and move through it um because it doesn't happen overnight and even you know being being with this for a couple years there's moments that I'll catch myself and I'll be like oh no that that's no I need to you know move through that feeling we're not we're human we're not perfect beings by any stretch of the imagination but yeah awareness would be my my biggest takeaway from this conversation to to leave you all with well thank yeah. you go ahead Anna I I just would love to invite everyone to be really gentle with themselves. This is not easy. This is not simple. And this can be, you know, the start of something great, being a little bit rebellious, being really curious about kind of the hand-me-down rules that you have around the way you interact with Halloween candy, the way you ask your family to interact with Halloween candy, Acknowledging that bodies digest factually, not judgmentally. <laughs> all, all, like all food is all food is food, and we need energy. And it is super duper duper important that you are enjoying the things that you eat. Um, please don't be disheartened if you witness things that make you feel a little bit anxious um, with regard to witnessing your family interacting with Halloween candy. I, I am not a parent and I have a number of colleagues and a number of friends who actually portion for their young kids candy, give, they get to choose, but they have like a couple of pieces of candy with all the meals, like lunch and dinner and snacks. Build it in, right? This is not, we're not making candy like this big thing that you have to earn. It's just, it's, just food and it tastes good and it's okay yeah i think that's an absolutely perfect way to, to end it's just food and it tastes good and it's okay so thank you so much to the two of you for joining for everyone else who joined us um and um hope everyone has an amazing halloween and rest of this holiday season thank you thank All you right. so much. thanks for having me thanks for being here Thank mm -hmm. you.